uh, so today so today where is the recording okay so let's today uh let's start with um, the other topic today actually we will continue with ancient civilizations but we'll move to the far east and uh, then to uh uh then to uh than to uh, ancient Greece in the end. So I started sharing... Áno, že vám vzdielam obrazovku, ak toto, kvôli tomuto. Ak ste chceli toto. Dobre, OK, so I believe everything is working fine uh, right now. So, uh, previous lesson we started, uh, we ended up with this Hittite Empire and we actually in, uh, talked about the others, so on. So let's move on. Uh, let's move on to the far east. We have a lot of pictures. So the next one, oh, there were actually two far eastern uh, Asian civilizations that we concern among these ancient ones, uh, or the river civilizations, that's ancient India and then ancient China. Uh, India is actually a very interesting country that is a cradle of uh, two main world religions and also important for some other contributions that we have in here. So when you toss this uh, task at the Omatorita uh, school living exam, so you, know, you should definitely start with the with the rivers in here. Apart from Ganga that is uh, flowing down uh, beneath the Himalayas uh, to the Bengal Bay, uh, the, the oldest uh, settlements appeared in, along the Indus River and it gave name also to India itself. Uh, the Indus uh, got spring also uh, in uh, high mountains in Pamir, which is the second highest mountain range in the world. So there were very regular big floods in the period of, of rains and uh, people could also come with these floods and they could uh, grow like great amounts and surplus of food in here. Uh, there were a couple of cities uh, built already in the Neolithic period and especially in Bronze Age period that we can suppose civilizations. Among them, there are two famous and that's Harappa and the other is Mohenjo Daro. If you remember when we had this topic in like second grade, I told you that it really sounds uh, sounds maybe similar, familiar to you uh, with the language that you could heard also here in Slovakia. And that's the language of Romani people that actually probably were uh, people living in India in these times and were also the guys who built this one. Uh, they were really highly developed and uh, uh, when also excavations were done, so archaeologists discovered uh, plenty of buildings that had a couple of interesting things. Obviously, uh, they were planned. It was not like a, uh, accidental, coincidental, coincidental um, building uh, houses anywhere, but it was obviously like architectural planning. So there were streets with uh, right angles, and also there was system of sewers and. Uh, this was interesting because uh, there was canalizations brought from the river and uh, it was taking all the waste uh, from the town. But also in every house, there was actually a toilet, a latrine, and it was using water again to take the waste away from here. So uh, that was interesting that even when they had some uh, containers with water and they put it in the sun, so they had also warm water in colder months for example so that was actually kind of like modern canalization system in the city of Mohenjo-daro the other thing was that in the middle of the town there was a huge piscine or pool uh probably not for swimming competitions but for maybe some ritual bathing that is probably connected also with indian cultures even today especially along the ganga river uh there is a video by John Green, of course, we are not going to watch it uh, about this Indian civilization if you want to know more about it. Uh, this civilization actually ended up uh, with invasion, uh, invasion of Aryan tribes. Aryans belong to uh, Indo-European, uh, Indo-European group and they spoke Hindi. So this is actually the beginning of India as we know it, because in the other at, like ethnolinguistic group is arriving to India. This was probably like violent invasion. Um, interesting thing is that Mohenjo-daro and Harappa disappeared, had disappeared uh, many years before this uh, migration of Indo-Aryans. Uh, we don't know why. The is a big surprise and one thing that is absent in archaeological excavations in here were weapons so maybe even before Aryans or Indo-Aryans came so 
uh, they just disappear, maybe because of climate changes. Uh, what Aryans brought uh, to India and they settled in this northern part was definitely the, this pyramid uh, of uh, Bronze Age cultures that we know, for example, from Egypt, but also later on from me medieval period. And it is a system that you have people uh, who are privileged and called, divided into soldiers and shamans or priests and so on and so on. So uh, in this way, these Aryans introduced the caste system, especially in uh, northern India. And what you see, this color of, I don't know, yellow or green, yellow. I'm not sure. I'm a man, so I can't recognize the shades. Uh, but in the south, as you, there were there still uh, original population of so-called Dravidian languages, Dravidske Yaziki, and there were these original Indian people living that had been living there before. Uh, so this is interesting that actually our Romanic people uh, can understand some words, some language speaking in southern India, not so much in northern India. And also this distinction in India uh, actually added this uh, Bronze Age system that they created castes, castle or casti, and it looked like probably like this. Uh, those who were actually from all this original population and they uh, were oppressed, so they will start to be called like uh, untouchables or Dalits. And even today, uh, despite since 1950s, it is illegal in India to concern people like according to castes, but still it is there and people who are untouchable. So they're allowed to do like these street cleaners or latrine cleaners and so on. And really they are secluded. And this seclusion actually also comes from these Romani people who from those lands, they start to migrate to Asia, to Europe and about like um, high middle ages they uh, arrived even to europe to slovakia and still keep this separation and of course uh, populations er everywhere anywhere in the world they try to banish them then they were uh, shudras they were like uh, people from the lowest casta of this aryan indo aryan or hindu hindu population and people who were un not uneducated actually they would be like the lowest but still there is another like not part of the casta. So shudras are actually workers, servants, uh, people like uh, selling in the streets, you know, or just begging and so on. Still, some of them are higher in their system like uh, than Dalits. Then you got Vaishas that are like people who had some, let's say, craft or manual work, but uh, they need some skill and practice. And that's why they are like farmers, merchants, tradesmen, artisans, and so on. Then there are Kshatriyas. Uh, Kshatriyas uh, are uh, usually soldiers. And because of so being a soldier, it means also to uh, control the country and to mean it means to manage it. So that's why they became like state officers, administrators. Uh, and of course, among them, the most skilled uh, with the greatest charisma, they became Rajas and uh, rulers in India. So this is a really, really good caste in here. And the highest caste in India are Brahmans or Brahmins, uh, who were used to be priests. And today, uh, today there are like these intellectuals, teachers, for example, the richest part, like Rajesh Kutrapali's family doctor, you know. So they were from this highest case. That's why they're very rich. Why there is this development still today? Actually, they start to combine uh, a local uh, religions with this caste system created in something that we know from Hinduism and again from Buddhism as one of the branches of Hinduism that believe in uh, like almost eternal life of uh, soul that is not dying with the body that just like in the Europeans so Aryans brought uh, the funeral that were uh, made of in fire so made fire like that was done in fire so they believe that when the body is uh, burned so it the soul can be released and can go to uh, the next uh, to the next body and can be born again and they believe that according to their good or bad deeds they are moving from one sect to another or one caste to another so they're not they're not very good people so they are like going they're going to be born again in lower case maybe even in a, uh, as Dalits or even worse as animals or I don't know, whatever. So this was the system in Hinduism where there are plenty of gods that was introduced also along the Ganga River uh, and um, uh, created what we know and in this Indian or Hindu Hinduistic system of religion. 
OK, what else uh, do we have in here? Um, OK, Varanasi, so the city of temples. This is one of the sacred towns of Hinduism. It's called like city of the temples because not only Hinduistic temples, but there are many. Uh, there are many even Buddhist temples, Muslim temples, and I think that you can find also a Christian church there. I'm pretty sure about this. Uh, I shall speak soon about Buddhism because Prince Siddhartha was living somewhere also uh, along the Ganga River near these uh, territories near Varanasi or near Benares as the other name for this. And it created brand new system for them. Uh, also, they use this incarnation of souls. They believe many demons and gods that uh, Hinduism also believed. But uh, they start to praise like the other way of how to stop this system of reincarnation and how to be even better. But I shall come to that point uh, in a minute. OK, what else? Hinduism, if I ask you about some contributions of uh, all these cultures, so definitely you can mention Mahabharata and Ramayana, epic stories, epic poems um, about uh, like war between gods and heroes and demons and monkey king and so on. And there are many, many things uh, mentioned there that are really interesting, like great fantasy story and uh that's why there would used to be bonus not for you of course for look for the mentions uh, about aircraft and about atomic bomb in these poems over the internet that was really interesting buddha and ashoka so let's move on there are a couple of pictures only to show some descriptions of course hinduistic indian culture is typical for its specific uh, artistic canon in here all the gaudis and shiva uh, Vishnu, uh, Krishna, of course, uh, Ganesha, but also evil gods like uh, Kali and so on. Actually, uh, Krishna is uh, the god, the creator, but also the destroyer, because for them, the, the, the death is actually the beginning for is another beginning. So that's why also I, I believe this is also a picture from Varanasi, uh, some ascetic priest uh, from India uh, taking this ritual bath in Ganga that for us probably looks very well, they're very badly, but for them is like sacred water for them. Uh, this is also illustration from this uh, Ramayana, like Rama fighting his demons and the monkey king army and so on. Why I did uh, added these swastikas? Uh, swastika, uh, this sign of a cross was a famous sign, is still famous sign in Hinduism and Buddhism too. And uh, uh, if you hear somebody talking about that Adolf Hitler, uh took it from buddhism because they believe that aryans used to be like blonde uh blonde haired and blue eyed guys not living in india but like in europe somewhere in caucasian maybe in tibet somewhere beneath the um, dalagiri or some other mountain that used to be like their shangri-la so he adopted also swastika that he probably saw also in ancient Greece. I will come to that again. Uh, but of course, if somebody is using swastika today and is not Hinduistic or Buddhist priest, so probably he's a Nazi, you know, neo-Nazi. But these are actually seal seal rings uh, from Buddhism. But as you can see, that uh, these were uh, turned in opposite shape. And although Hitler shaped it like this, this is really rare to see like this. And this is like Nazi swastika in this form when you reverse it in colors. Okay, when I talk about these religions, this is Kali, the goddess of death, for example, and especially this uh, story about Buddha, Prince Siddhartha. Maybe you just, uh, it's good. I really recommend you to watch this movie. Uh, despite trailer is not very, it's not very, very cool. It's story from like 1993 and it combines, uh, it combines the story of uh, Prince Siddhartha acted by Keanu Reeves and actually contemporary times that uh, and belief of Tibetan, Tibetan, monks who believe that this reincarnation of soul is going to the higher creatures and they believe that they are religious leaders of uh, tibetan uh, great road uh, of uh, buddhism are being born as uh, dalai lamas uh, and dalai lama so when the last one he died so uh, they believe that uh, his soul turns into this boy in seattle uh, usa so they actually visited like you see his famous actor and uh, they, they just talk to these kids and take him for a visit uh, to Nepal, where uh, Nepal and India, where Tibetan monks live in exile. Because, as you know, the Chinese 
uh, People's Republic invaded, uh, Tibet occupied it, and so on. And gradually, the, the story is changing from this contemporary, also with Keanu Reeves' story of uh, Prince Siddhartha, how he lived in luxury in his palace, but one day he got outside of his palace, and for the first time in his life, he saw suffering, death, uh, diseases, and he started to feel compassion, tried to live as a static guy, but then he realized that probably the harmony is hidden in kind of a balance and getting rid of any desires. And this is what Buddhism is about in here and created like great brand new world religion that is sometimes more like philosophy. Of course, for them, it's like real religion. And so very, very open minded and accepting and very tolerant. So in my I saw, I've seen a couple of movies about Buddhism, but this is really one of the one of the best. And for you as history guys and cultural people and lawyers and so on, it can be really enriching. Okay, thanks for trailer. Uh, thanks for trailer. Uh, where are we? This is my presentation. Okay, so this is also the moment when Buddha finally found this understanding and ultimate accepting. And he used to be, according to Buddhist tradition, uh, he was the one who got rid of these desires and managed to get uh, his soul out of his body and. Uh, gain a state of mind called nirvana like ultimate bless you know ultimate blessing and uh, satisfaction that means that you just don't feel anything and for them and buddhism brought something new that hinduism didn't have the end of the cycle of reincarnation of soul from one body to another and it means that you that your soul find when you are just like buddha or dalai lama or some like meditating priest and so on so your soul cannot don't need to be born again and just evaporates in the universe and actually the death of the soul this evaporation is final climax because you don't live you don't desire you don't feel anything and this is what buddhism is trying to to keep so really interesting and uh that's why india what do you have to tell us about india it's another thing uh, telling more things about india because i didn't add it what happened with india later on they created great kingdoms there were many kingdoms in here with rajas and so on of course they had to fight against many invasions uh, especially against mongols actually mongols uh, allowed to creation of very important empire called moguls and Mongols were finally defeated by British in the 18th century. Even British had to fight French for the dominance in India. But still, you know, that Portuguese actually discovered India uh, before that. But none of these guys had enough power to overrule it, just like China. And that's why British managed to control India, only in the case that they picked up the most powerful, the most loyal Rajas, gave them weapons, uh, proclaimed them the citizens of uh, United Kingdom. Of course, they had to accept the Queen Victoria, let's say. And then uh, they allowed them to conquer other surrounding neighbor neighboring uh, kingdoms and principalities in India. In this way, they created uh, very loyal, uh, very loyal parts of Indian society to the British. Among them, six, for example, they had also their own empire or kingdom. And that's why many of them like loyally fought in both world wars but most of the majority of population of course wanted independence and that's the story we already had in 20th century let's move to china very quickly china is a bit different because if you look in the map and huang ke and yangtze rivers uh the terrain is not so uh plain like it was in pakistan for example you see that uh, around there are mountains but this is really like flat plain but it is really like motionless. And uh, here another plant uh, was growing, uh, crops was growing just like in India and provided a lot of food, and that was rice. This crop's rice, of course, needs these flooded fields, as you could see in Vietnam or these lowlands of uh, China. But even in hilly uh, parts of China, these Huang and Yangtze rivers flowing from Tibet I had these annual huge floods. You've probably seen it somewhere in the videos when they open this dam, artificial dam, and have these artificial floods, but they are like a huge wave. But what that what happens? This water is actually uh standing still in small ponds on the slopes of the hills. And if you build these terraces, so you can keep it, and even in mountains, you can produce enough rice for a huge population. China definitely for all its history 
was the most populated country in the world. And even in the times of uh, like uh, European civilization, somewhere in here in China, these ancient dynasties had towns with millions of population. When Rome in ancient times of Roman Empire managed to have one million population, you got like 20 towns in China with one million people. So that's this part of the fact that China with the system of government, how it is today, it's really important to know it and uh, maybe to study it, like really fascinating. So the Long River and the Yellow River were the basic ones, but even there was Mekong flying down to Vietnam, for example. All of these allowed to build a huge culture. Uh, what do you need to know about the calendars uh, of Chinese dynasties? We also managed to have it. Uh, of course, transcription in English is very different from Slovak, and it, it it would be good if you can study it for yourselves. You never know when you happen with this, like Chia or Xia dynasty or Shang or Chou, not Zhou, but Chou, for example, Western is and Chou. You see even like from 2000 years BC, uh, Qin dynasty, Han dynasty, uh, Six Dynasties era, and all of them with uh, their names, Sui Tang, uh, Song, Yuan, Ming, that is also, we are already in Middle Ages in here, Qing dynasty or Qing dynasty, and uh, finally, we have the last one, and then we have Republic of China and Communist China, e even with Taiwan today. I also edited it because there are a lot of uh, articles about Chinese history over over internet, so it's no problem to find many of the timelines in here, so it can be easy to understand even with some uh, simple descriptions that you can see in here. Okay, so there are plenty of it, so that's why I didn't add didn't add more pictures like these, but just to show you uh, how you can Google it and and find it. Okay, the Klamakan Great Wall. Okay, big long river, Chang and Huangke. What else? So there are many of them, as you can see. It's a never ending story for us. So, okay, all of, all of these. If you'd like to study Chinese stuff, you can go to Budapest. They replaced uh, Soros University, very good Central European University, by this Chinese that is coming. Okay, what else? Um, of course, uh, John Green got this video, but what I wanted to show you also uh, about China, what do you need to know? Great inventors, great contributions, including paper, gunpowder that actually was invented by Koreans and even was used as a, uh, as a as in the military. It was used in Korea for the first time. Uh, also, they didn't use typical artillery as cannons because it was invented by Ottoman Turks, not by Chinese themselves. But a specific like gunpowder, missiles, rockets, using some darts and so on. Compass, as we know it today, uh, invented in China, but even very like ancient form. Porcelain and silk were two commodities, uh, products from Asia, from China, that even Europeans valued well, so much that during times of Roman Empire, uh, they established and built actually the trade road, the route called the Silk Road that led from Constantinople to China. And its interruption caused even, for example, age of discovery. So great history of China, of course, with the Great Wall that you know it was being during like many, many uh, centuries, not only decades, they tried to protect from invasions from the north, from Mongolia, Russia and invasions of Huns at the beginning and Mongolians in the end. Actually, it didn't have that. It helped them because, for example, the Ming dynasty was the one that actually pulled down the Xi'an dynasty that was Mongolian. Kublai Khan, a good friend of Marco Polo, uh, was actually Chinese uh, emperor that uh, built Beijing, the capital of new China of this dynasty. And also it is forbidden city, as as you know. Maybe also it's it may be good for you to watch the the last uh, Emperor movie by Bernardo Bertolucci, despite being from the 20th century, but also giving lots of information, a lot of information from this history. What else? Okay, modern coins as we know it, but in China even before Phoenicians. So you see there are big differences between civilizations in the Middle East and Far East. Sometimes the connection was not probably called this part of the trade. And also first paper money that, you know, in Europe, they appeared in Venice in Middle Ages, maybe like late Middle Ages in Renaissance, but in China, they used kind of uh, uh, loan decrees or uh, that you have a loan on somebody, you just can. So that's why they use this paper.
Okay, what else? Uh, of course, some of the emperors uh, were really huge, and this mandate of heaven made them like gods, like the father of China, and great respect of patriarchal society and subjection to subjection to the emperor. One of these very famous uh, Qixing Huang emperor in uh, in China that was discovered this huge tomb that is created of. Uh, thousands of statues of made of terracotta of soldiers each statue is different with different uniform a different face and features and so on and probably they used to be colored they probably carried like real bronze weapons uh, iron weapons and had these like protect him in the heavens actually what the chinese believed in because they had a couple of religions and even today it's combination of course despite of uh, socialism there uh, their main is Taoism. Taoism is based uh, belief on these, uh, how to say, Asian belief in demons and ghosts of your past away. Uh, forefathers and parents, grandparents, for example. Probably you've seen also some Miyazaki movies. It's Japanese, of course, but Japanese took over Chinese letters. Chinese alphabet, it is pictorial, of course, and also kind of this belief that you, they respect your the ghosts and forefathers, and many of these movies kept this. Of course, they respected some animistic uh, religions of uh, like natural gods of nature and animals and so on. It was added with great, uh, how to say, moral code created by philosophers and poets like Confucius uh, and Lao Tzu. Uh, this actually created main character of Chinese philosophy and religion together from also Shintoism to Japan, for example. Later Buddhism came and it actually completely perfectly fit into this uh, ancient Chinese Taoistic philosophy. So uh, Chinese, if they are believers, if they are not considered atheists, so they are like Buddhists or Taoists here and it's really like big interaction among them and combination of all of these. So even combination when you compare Buddha uh, in uh, India, that is ascetic, sometimes blue, blue colored, blue skinned, you know, uh, and skinned, uh, skin thin guy, uh, like ascetic. So Buddha can be like a, uh, also like meditating sometimes like this tibetan like a king and sometimes smiling fat man that is bringing happiness because this part actually today in china being like this fat is really for them concerned to be like very ugly and they really mock people and not very polite about this but buddha for them like being this fat and smiling is bringing luck and fortune especially so if you like rob his i don't know head so it should gives you like brings you money and wealth and so on okay another timeline of chinese history i can't remember what was that so let's check it out okay this is another big one so uh if you just google this time of chinese history you can learn it and read it i know that many of you uh really like these asian studies oriental studies so it's good to read extra of course we don't have much about china in our slovak curriculum of for history so that's why i just added it with more and yeah we come to to chiang kai shek and uh, sun yat-sen in here okay and mao Zedong in the end Okay, uh, let's close it and move it. I believe there are a couple of pictures. Okay, uh, Confuci uh, Confucius in Latin, very famous and uh, excellent. When I was like maybe seven years old, I learned a quote by him because, you know, I read a lot and I just like today, I believe I'm a smart guy. <laughs> so I used to like always like uh, give advice, you know, and tell them how to do and Many people didn't like me very much and tell me that I pretend to be smart. And once Confucius was uh, told like that he was pretending to be smart, like I am I pretending to be the smart? Then uh, then you know maybe perhaps only at the at the fools I'm able of great and intelligent and and smart reply. <laughs> so yeah, of course I made him even angry even more. Okay, so let's read some of them. If you're the smartest person in the room then you are in the wrong room. <laughs> so that was actually against him and my own. Uh, okay, this is nice. Everything has a beauty, but not everyone sees it. Well, silence is a true friend uh, who never betrays. Mm. Uh, who's over you go, where's over you go, go with all your heart. Okay, fine. 
When it's obvious that goals cannot be reached, don't adjust the goals, adjust the action steps. This is actually a good thing that you need to remember in these difficult times and study. Choose the job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. And this is cool. And this is why I picked up history because this is my passion. And uh, when somebody's wondering why I do so, like work so much, because I say it's my hobby, I just got a free time. Actually, the video you watch on Wednesday, that was my free time activity that I use also in this way. I believe it was nice. I got only three likes, so I was a bit sad, but whatever. Okay, who have two lives and the second begins when we realize we only have one. Mm -hmm. Okay. And seven wise quotes by Confucius. And when I was starting, like, look, searching, I found that there are actually 10. And there are 73 Confucius, 130 famous Confucius quotes. So, you know, I found this one that the whole Confucius thing is a bit confusion with Jackie Chan. And, you know, Confucius, Confucius said it's confusing. <laughs> so this is really cool. And probably this is what the best, the wise Chinese man once said. And you got it. Okay, guys. So I believe that's all from China. Of course, yeah, yeah we got laughing Buddha. Okay, don't forget about these Chinese inventions because I'm going this spring um, break. Uh, during the spring break, I'm going to change uh, our maturita tasks for your oral examination. And definitely there will be these things in here. Maybe with a large thing, but if you can't remember Chinese inventions, more of them. So it's bad. So that's why I did more like. 12 of them and you'll be surprised how uh, great the Chinese civilization was and why we talk about Eurocentristic thing. Okay, we are ending up with this thing. So I check uh, how much time I have. Dobre, nezabudnite, decka, kto sa náhodou neskôr pripojil, že máte otázku uh, o nejakom webinári, workshope. A dobre, Vika, môžeš ísť, jas, jasné, bež. Takéto veci na decka mne nemusíte písať. V podstate stačí to vaše triedne napísať, dobre? Ale vyzerá, že sa vám to páči, čo sa veľmi teším, decka. Dávam samozrejme čas na esej písať. Vy už máte vlastne o dva týždňa odovzdať seminárku, či potom už budete mať času dosť. A ja to teda začnem dohadovať, dobre, ešte ačkarom dáme vedieť chudákom, ale vám by som to dal, lebo vy ste na to perfektní angličtina, preto nás aj oslovili, že si mysleli, že vy ste inteligentní, parádni, keďže vás učím ja, <laughs> ale hlavne preto, že ste angličtina, slovenčina, že by ste mali byť v podstate dobrí prekladatelia a veľa sa pritom naučíte, keď učíte iných ľudí. OK, guys, so let's move on and my time, how much time? 37, ale ja som začal skôr, takže budem podľa tohto času 26 minút nejaký, 25 minút, 25 minutes. Cool. Let's start another topic with ancient civilization. And when we move on, we got, you see, antiquity, ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Uh, I added many pictures with this ancient Greek uh, presentation, so I believe you'll enjoy it. And especially Roman uh, uh, ancient history, I got brand new presentations, so I believe you, you like it. So when we move on, of course, Greece will be probably one big or maybe two big tasks. Today I'm going to start with it and that would be really difficult, I think, for me to manage. But Greece and Rome are really important for you because you'll need it for studying uh, law, uh, politics, uh, policy, uh, actually anything, you know, culture. So Greeks were really cool guys. Studying materials, of course, you have plenty of books, but these are basic for the guys. History text we got at school, got them at school, but many other books and you have. Okay, again, geography of Greece very quickly because I shall repeat it again. Don't forget about like rough mountains. I really, one of my dreams was climb Mount Olympus that is higher than the Gerolachowski Stid peak. Uh, and also then have a bath, you know, near Thessalonic and this Chalkidiki. Uh, what is important, Greeks lack any plains like these other ancient river civilizations. That's why we have them separated from these river civilizations of ancient times. So you got only a couple of uh, these uh, like valleys and plains, maybe basins, that could be the better word, uh, where they could grow like food, but they didn't have enough space. So that's why they had to go like travel outside of these Peloponnese and Attica Peninsula. The other thing is that due to mountainous uh, terrain, rough terrain, uh, Greeks only once in their history, actually twice in their complete history, got unified. It was during times of Alexander the Great of Macedonia 
and then today like contemporary Greece since the 19th century. Otherwise, there were many city-states fighting each other. The, the third uh, character of geography of Greece is very rough coast with a lot of bays and, and uh, um, steep cliffs and uh, a lot of islands around and sea around allowed them to be excellent navigators and travel around the world. So what do you need to know? Again, mountains, rock coasts and bays, 2,000 islands in the islands in the Aegean Sea, but also warm climate. This is important for uh, one thing that you cannot actually grow, let's say, cattle, livestock in the times like cows and, and sheep, for example. So goat is like animal that can like without any problems live in this terrain and climate but also like so cheese goat cheese was important wine growing from egypt and olives it became like main um, source of nutrition vitamins for them okay so we are not going to talk about meteora and these temples or about uh these like resorts but for example the delphi the oracle of ancient ancient greece in here okay so what do we have thanks to these natural conditions so one language hellenic hellenic language we call it greek they call it hellenic but many city states that we will completely like make this history of ancient greece they were great sailors and thanks to this they expanded and colonized overseas of course for you because you already know it we had this part about ethnicity Greeks are in the Europeans. They call their own country, whole lands called Hellas or Hellada, and they call themselves Hellenes. Generally, all of them are called Hellenes, Helleni. Uh, there are actually disputes whether they came from, they themselves learned that they came from Balkans and Central Europe from the Nubian Basin, which is really interesting for us. Uh, because we have only one like connection with them, and this is uh, Misha Worka, but it's only one rampart with this Greek uh, style thing. So even Eduard Hmelar, you know this so claim politician, he tried to issue, he tries to issue a book, publish a book about history, and immediately archaeologists who, who just like uh, discussed in Facebook side about it, like said that we were not like exporting weapons in bronze age to greece no only like one was found that was not like like huge export you know so there is only one connection we're not sure but you know that migrations were like it's like thick book like this about them okay you need to divide uh, the periodization of greek history in uh, basic uh, like five periods generally uh first part is actually first civilizations in the island of Crete, we call it Minoan civilization, and then Mycenaean civilization, according to Tal Mycene, that you know as Mycenae. Uh, these are actually Bronze Age, uh, Bronze Age civilizations, so they lived in here, they had two types of letters, we'll talk about that. Then uh, during this period, uh, we have invasions of three tribes that Greeks or Hellenes counted uh, or teach that they were derived from and they had been derived from and they were Achaeans, Achaitsi, Ionians, Ioni and Dorians, Dorovia. They came during this period and Dorians came in this last period, uh, like in great changes actually, Bronze Age period. And uh, probably this Dorian invasion caused, I would call it cataclysm or maybe just came after that, we don't know. But what happened that during this Dorian rule, uh, suddenly, Greeks didn't use writing system. Both of the alphabets or writing scripts that uh, Cretans and Mycenaeans had been using, called linear writing A and linear writing B, uh, just disappeared. For so for about like three, four centuries, they were not using any any writing system in here. That's why we don't have historical documents and mentions from these, and we call it the dark period, like period covered with darkness of unknown things that's why dorians uh, are supposed to be like simple like barbarian and so on we don't know because dorians seem to be like very similar to ionians and achaeans for some reason they just didn't use writing system when you don't write your notes you forget and your brain doesn't like forgetting so brain usually creates image how it looked like and of course if you believe you combine in gods and goddesses you combine it with these real historical events with uh with uh with these legends and that's why the dark period is called also the homer period because poet homer 
created uh, his great stories of Iliad and Odyssey, if real, happening around in this period, during this period, maybe in here. So actually, it's a beautiful combination example that how you combine and match all these influences together. That's why sometimes it's told like legends and myths period, the dark period and Homeric period and so on. Many stories that I'm going to tell you or you read about, you know, that are from these times and uh, they may combine real things of Icarus and Daedalus and Icarus and, and Labyrinth and Maze and Knossos and Athenians and many, many other parts. Only when suddenly in about the year like uh, between eighth, uh, the beginning of the eighth century BC, a uh, couple of things happened. First, that Greeks started to use a script again. They called it alphabeta, according to first two letters of Greek alphabet. We will have it in the end again. And they started to write and mem and memorize it and remember. And thanks to this, they start to value a lot of knowledge and create something that we later call about classical knowledge and so on. Together with this, they organized first Olympic Games and they started to count their history exactly. That's why since this like 800 approximately BC, we start to talk count Greek ancient history and we talk about antiquity, antica, only when script is restored in Greece, we start to talk about antiquity. At the same time, Rome was established, for example, first Olympic Games and first city-states appeared. That will be important. Still, anti Greece is divided in three periods. It's archaic, classical, and Hellenistic. Archaic, typical for creation of new forms of government, and so on. Classical for great age of Athens, but at the same time, terrible wars that devastated Greece so much that when Macedonians invaded Greece, unified all Greeks together because even Macedonians were Greeks too. So they start to spread it to other countries with the conquest of Persia, Egypt, and spreading Greek culture. So this Hellene culture, and when it's something Greek-like, Hellene-like, it's Hellenistic. Keď niečo myronistické, tak je to ako myron. Okay? Niečo je to danoistické, tak je to ako danoslovák. So in this way, Hellenistic means like Greek-like culture spreading in Egypt, in Middle East, and even in Afghanistan or even in India. And these years are approximately years when Roman Republic invaded, uh, invaded Greek Hellenistic kingdoms and finally converted. After Romans, Byzantine Empire, and again after Byzantine, Ottoman Turks, and since their Greek ceased independence. OK, musím si čeknúť čas detská, aby som vám to potom nenatiahol, čiže nejakých 15 minút. Dobre, OK, všetko OK, so let's go back. It's so very quickly, because you don't need to tell me more, but of course, if you're going to study for admission tests at universities, it may appear uh, all around in here. So as I said, let's start with this ancient civilization of Bronze Age period. Mycene, as I said, is called according to the city of Mycene, that even according to Homer, uh, it was the capital town of this civilization around, of this Achaean civilization. The other was in the island of Crete, and it was not called Cretan civilization, but it was called Minoan. It is given also from the legends about King Minos, who was legendary king in this uh, palace in Knossos, having this maze and labyrinth and terrible monster called Minotauros, like half man, half bull. And he kept him in this maze and he fed him with the young boys and girls uh, from Athens and Mycenae and other city-states. They were subjected to Minoan uh, kingdom of Crete. But you know about these legends of Ariadne thread and so on. For us, of course, it means that it was only here. But civilization was, uh, was really valid in here. This Mycenae look more like European, this Bronze Age, like from our Carpathian Basin, but this Cretan was something between this and something between Egyptian. Both of these were using linear writing. Linear writing A hasn't been deciphered yet, so you have a chance, guys. And linear writing B is the other one. I believe I got some examples in here. Not Sorry for that. Okay, uh, Reno civilization, as I said, was well in this uh, Knossos. Today you can see beautiful but concrete fake ruins of uh, Knossos. It was a huge palace and concerning Bronze Age scale. Imagine guy coming from anywhere, even from continental Greece. I can't imagine guy coming from Sitno, let's say, and seeing this this building. So he, of course, got lost in here. And during the dark period, 
uh, probably it, it turned into be this is the ground plan of this Knossos Palace. It turned out to be like the maze for them. So, you know, very often these legends have some like, you know, leaf of truth you know, hidden inside. And it's really interesting. So this is Knossos. Okay, what is important for us, maybe for us, that uh, how also Taurus, so the bulls uh, popped up in this legend, is that many of the wall paintings in, uh, and mosaics in uh, Knossos have this uh, depiction of uh, kind of a games, maybe, or sport, uh, when some guys are jumping over bulls, some of them are holding horns, so some dangerous Toreadors, Matadors games, I don't know, from ancient Greek. Guys look very different from other Greek Zacchaeans. And what happened? This civilization suddenly disappeared uh, even before arrival of Dorians, which for many years we believed that uh, they were the cause of the destruction. But probably it seems to be that all coastal towns of Crete were being destroyed by a huge tsunami wave. You know that even Greece is close to these volcanic and earthquake areas, and very often there are some explosions and earthquakes all around, and they cause tsunami waves. And one of these waves actually destroy all the fishers' villages along the coast and probably destroy all complete, like, food production territory from the kings on Knossos because Knossos is high in the hills above the sea, far away from the sea. So they maybe just disappeared. And there is one uh, of the possible explanations that which uh, eruption could cause it because in ancient times there was island of Terra with a volcano and with some city state around. And according to Herodotus, uh, there was an uh, ancient kingdom called Atlantis and once there was a huge volcano eruption that actually caused that this Atlantis developed civilization got sunk, drawn in the sea. The true thing is that this small city state on the island of Terra was destroyed by volcanic eruption, that only crater remained. That's why we talk about Contiki Terra and Antiki Terra, two islands today. And uh, down in the sea, deep in the sea, uh, the scuba divers archaeologists discovered some of the ships from a bit later period, but very close to this. And that was kind of this uh, wheel rust, wheel rust like mechanism. And in this video, it looks like this. And this is maybe like 8th century BC. And they tried to reconstruct it. And it's a long video, so I'm not going to show it, but I just click it over. And they start to realize that the size and how it could have worked and they start to count even the uh, like rotating of sun and moon and and planets and actually they created a whole like astronomy box like counting the calendar maybe like ancient greek computer i would call it so mechanical stuff this is one of the examples that we will end up in the end uh, with archimedes uh in the end that what Greeks were capable of doing. Okay, so this was Minoian. What about Mycenae, Mycenaean civilization? It is mentioned in Homer's epic stories of the Iliad as the capital of uh, these Achaean kingdoms and all the kings from Ithaca, Sparta were subjected to Agamemnon, the king of this. Uh, Mycenae is actually much older than this, despite Heinrich Schliemann, the guy, archaeologist who discovered Troy. After discovery of Troy, he came to Mycenae and started with further excavations. And he was lucky again because he uncovered this lion's gate with huge stones that uh, in legends in the dark period, they, they, they believe that humans can live these big stones. So they had legend that Cyclops, these giants with one eye, uh, erected them and held these kings of Mycenae. But he was lucky to find the tomb of Mycenaean kings uh, with golden funeral mask. I think that you shall you will you will see it later on. And uh, of course, he called it Agamemnon's mask. Despite it was like three, four centuries before that. Uh, it was much older. But as you see, that reconstruction of ancient Mycenae, the city itself was not bigger than uh, Mishia Horka. And what is interesting, even this Piskish to Mishia Horka rampart in Hillfort, uh, so they had very similar architecture and also they had uh, the same uh, ceramics pottery so size. So there is probably. Um, evidence of international trade at least or maybe even colonizing 
uh, these lands in Carpathians that some of these like colony of Mycenaeans maybe stayed here or just people traded with them but not very big but we are in bronze age so it's not as big as in Crete and uh, in, in the end at the end of this uh, uh, story there were supposed to be this Homer's Iliad according to the city of Ilion that is another Greek name for the city of Troy so the Trojan war it, it was not believed to be true because Homer uh, had it as a very long epic poem that even today Greeks had to learn by heart uh, Spartans had to learn all poem by heart in ancient times and he was supposed to be blind he tell it the day they are actually just like with Shakespeare people don't believe the only one author is there and maybe there were ma many like bards telling these stories together and Romans later we just sign it up but what Heinrich Schliemann proved that Trojan War actually happened not maybe in the scale as it is this that with all the great heroes of Aias, Achilles and Achilles fallen and uh, Hades or what is in here, the goddess of uh, anger or arguments and 100,000 men, but it's much smaller scale. Heinrich Schliemann was this archaeologist from Germany at the end of the 19th century who uh, believed that this story is uh, true and he dedicated all his life to discovery of Troy. He realized that he cannot do it without uh, not only like knowing the languages, so he learned 27 languages, he learned one language every year, but he, uh, after the studies of our, uh, of history, he studied economy and he studied and he started uh, with uh, doing business. And when he was like more than 40, over the 40 years old, uh, he had like a lot of a lot of companies. He sold them all and he got a lot of money. Then he traveled to Greece. He found himself a wife. She was archaeologist, Greek archaeologist. I think her name was Sophia, I'm not sure. And they went to Turkey, to Asia Minor, as we called it, the Romans called it in here. And only according to description in Homer Iliad, when it's like the rivers flowing next to each other, mountain Ida, and how the sunset was uh, pointing at the, at the walls of Troy and so on. So he picked up uh, a mound or a hill called Hisarlik, and he hired hundreds of diggers, of locals, and who actually start to dig the, the, the whole hill. And what a surprise, because after a couple of months, and removing like 10 or 20 meters of uh, earth, ground, they actually uncovered some, some excavations. But these excavations were not as big, and obviously they were from Roman times or maybe medieval period. So he said, let's just remove it and we go further. On this way, he destroyed many things in here and many stuff. For example, pottery for him was not important because he was looking only for gold, like this golden mask from Mycenae. Didn't care, so many of precious pottery was lost. Then we have like a Greek town, classical town, and suddenly we have this Bronze Age rampart. And what was interesting that this rampart obviously was destroyed by a big fire, and there were many tips of arrows found. And then for a couple of centuries there was no settlement. When finally people built it again in. Uh, archaic uh, antique period, uh, the city of Ilion. So that was actually proved that approximately about the year 1200 BC, there was some war and this like uh, city of Troy was destroyed. But as you can see, uh, it was a temple, a couple of buildings around and the whole city together was not very big, but it is Bronze Age period. Still, he didn't find and didn't find any gold. And in 19th century, archaeologists without discover gold was not archaeologists. So he ordered to destroy it again, this layer, and continue to the 12th layer. And uh, in uh, I think seven layers somewhere in here, he discovered another tomb with another gold. And this is a picture. Oh, this is why Sophia with golden diadems and necklaces and and uh, earrings and. He called it, you know, Helene's, Helene's treasury, Helene's treasury, Helene's book club. Of course, it was much, much older than Helene. So when somebody compares uh, Andre Kmet to Heinrich Schliemann, I'm really angry because this guy was not a real archaeologist. He was just a true raider. And it's like, still very famous for the discovery of Troy. What else? Four minutes, guys. Uh, I recommend you, if you remember, that you had to learn to do these uh, gods and goddesses. Be sure you know them all. But I want to show you guys that what second graders had to do and are supposed to do even right now. And what, as you historians, should know too. 
Okay, ancient Greek civilization, what's in here? So for the uh, plaque task, for the plaque task, I gave them much more. Open Sizami, okay, you are here. So ancient civilization, actually, I recommend you to do this when you study, when you learn, uh, when you prepare for the, for the exam. It's really good to have this kind of table with script, religion, cities, rulers, inventions, contributions for each of these civilizations. Okay, this is blind map, periodization, the Iliad and Odyssey with the characters from both stories. And this is something you need to know all of them, including Ecclesia, Aeropagus, Aeropagus, Kaloka, Gathia, the diets and so on. And Olympic Games, funny of them. Da -da 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 -da. Odyssey, and finally, in the end, look at this. Who are these mythological creatures? Write brief characteristics, and it's whole page for them. So many of them that you didn't have, like maybe Helios or Persephone, for example. Midas, King Midas, with his any, anything he touched, it turned to gold, and it was like curse for him. Okay, uh, so I recommend you to look at it and to have these things. So. Let me move on because we got two minutes, so I use it. We, again, this is part is about revision of this periodization, but including also Middle Ages and modern period. Then we start talking about antique Greece when again uh, Greeks started to learn alphabet, use alphabet again. And during this archaic period, within like between this eighth uh, and fifth century before Christ. Uh, big and important city-states came to exist. Of course, Athens and Sparta, but don't forget about very important kingdom of Corinth or Megara, Mycenae, still very important, Thebes as very important religious center. There were many of these states and together they were called polis. Polis in Greek means city-state. It's not only the town or city around, but also including fields and settlements around. Usually it's in one valley surrounded by hills. And over the hills, there is another polis that you hate and you fight and that's the thing usually each police must should have have some access to the sea so they could trade and look for new lands outside this archaic period is typical that the city states these police or policies had various forms of government that we know them and this oligarchy you remember rule of the riches or the privilege also called aristocracy aristocracy then we have monarchy but sometimes not we got monoarchos, one king, one ruler, one elder, but we got also duarchy or diarchy, so like two kings, like in Sparta, for example. Then Athenians discover what we I'm going to tell you in the next lesson is democracy, uh, the rule of the people and how this experiment uh, was changing and so on. And how often, like 30 times only in Athens, it turned into the tyranny that they call another form of democracy where uh, People just rule in the way they give power to one guy, to the tyrant. 30 tyrants rule like Pericles, Pesistratos. In here, you need to remember and to mention. What is important also, who had rights in these ancient civilization, uh, ancient Greek uh, city states, uh, where the only people who had right to own were men who had land and then they had rights to vote. No women, no foreign kids, of course, no slaves. And it was very easy to become a slave because it was enough when you have a debt, when you, or when you lend money and when you borrow money and you kind of like pay it back. So you become a slave for a while. Okay, next lesson, guys, we'll continue with lawgivers and democracy and, and all the stuff and Olympic games. And if I'll be good enough, I can move even to ancient Rome. So that's... All from me for today, guys. Takže uzatváram priamy prenos detská stop recording. Dobre, no 